Okay. I call this meeting to order. Is there any disclosure of pecuniary interest in that? Um, I've had a uh, request by Councilor, Regional Councilor Sean Collier that we uh, break our rules and uh, let him uh, speak of uh, Waive the rules of procedure wait, to wait. add one item to the agenda. <laughs> Thank you for speaking for me. I think I can take that for myself. Okay. <laughs> so, can we need a two-thirds uh, majority? What's being added to the agenda? Uh, apparently, uh, I want to add the discussion of the, the council resolution on the Kelly property on Ontario, just for discussion. Okay. All those in favor? All right, thank you. Sean? Go ahead. I'll go first. I thought it was under discussion. Or, Chair. Sure. Okay. Um, just, we, um, we first, and, and I guess, through you, Chair, Mr. Meredith, and sort of putting on the spot right away, Dave, but we, we moved a resolution on this property back in 2013 regarding an encroachment. Um, and I, I recently had an opportunity to go down there as far as I was contacted, as far as Polka, and the erosion that's happened on that property, and nothing's been done to enforce our encroachment agreement that was, I believe we gave direction in 2013, was it, Dave? 2013 was the resolution. So, so we're going on five years that this has been sitting and a lot has changed down there. So if anybody's been down there to see it, I think many of us have. It's eroded quite a bit. Back when the pictures were taken in 13, when this was brought to our attention, the water was about 10 feet out from the break wall. Now it's about 10 feet up from the break wall. Uh, also, the town has now installed a, a chain link fence um, on the property and it, the chain link fence is about a meter, 1.2 meters from the actual property line. I guess that was done because at the time I understand that, that it was winter and they couldn't dig with, uh, there's hydro, there's electricity under there so they had to put it in that location. So what I had been speaking with Mr. Meredith and I'd asked is given that there's probably about 20 feet to the east of this fence now that's been installed. Rather than go through the whole encroachment agreement thing, which is now kind of dated and things have changed, wouldn't it make sense just to sell the piece, leave the fence where it is, and the town would still have enough property to access our road allowance? And so I just wanted to get a comment from you, please, on that from a staff perspective, and is that something that, that colleagues would consider. I understand this is this is a contentious issue. The person is basically trespassing town property. However, this is something that's been going on for a long time and I think we just need to deal with it and move on. Ms. Meredith? Okay, a um, couple things. <coughs> um, first of all, going back to sort of the council resolution and the direction that was provided by council in 2013. Um, as, as part of that resolution, it was clear um, that the town did not wish to consider the disposal or the sale of any land to Mr. Kelly at that time. That was number one sort of in terms of that resolution. Do you mind speaking up? Sorry. <coughs> I said just going back to 2013 when this item was brought forward, there was discussion about the <coughs> sale and disposal of a portion of lands to Mr. Kelly at which time part of council's resolution was that we not consider the sale or disposal of of any lands to Mr. Kelly, and that the recommendation and resolution was that he entered into an encroachment agreement. The town has been in conversations with Mr. Kelly since, I think say approximately September of 2017, when he came to the operations center and inquired about the ability of doing additional shoring improvements to um, retain his existing seawall that he had. We indicated in, um, in the fall of 2017 that he had yet to enter into an encroachment agreement and that an encroachment agreement was still required before we'd authorize any additional works to take place along the shoreline. At the same time, Mr. Kelly was applying to CLOCA for a permit for these same works. Staff did have conversations with CLOCA sort of about the encroachment issue, at which time Cloak indicated they would not issue a permit until the town was satisfied with the appropriate encroachment agreement had been entered into. So we've had discussions over the course of the last three or four months with Mr. Kelly, and we have provided him with a draft of the encroachment agreement that enforces the resolution that was passed by council in 
2013. It is still staff's pet, um, position based on the council resolution that has been provided to us that we enforce the provisions of the encroachment agreement, which basically recognizes the fence location that was installed by the town a number of years ago and it gives Mr. Kelly up to two meters to encroach on the town lands to um, provide the appropriate um, shoreline improvements to provide the protection that he he so desires. It also allowed him to retain his existing walkway that he had running parallel to his house. Failure to Mr. Kelly based on the resolution, it would then have the town relocate the fence that's currently been erected to within a meter of his house, which would thereby remove his walkway, and that would be extended for the <coughs> property, and we'd be required to remove the encroachment of the improvements that he's made sort of along the, along the shorelines as well. So from a staff perspective, we've been clear that we've got one resolution by council, and that's the direction that we've been proceeding um, upon. As I mentioned, Mr. Kelly's had that um, agreement for approximately a month, and then we gave it to him the third week in April. And there's been some ongoing dialogue since that time, but there's been no sort of execution of that agreement um, from the town's perspective. So just follow up. Okay. Just, Dave, so if, if Mr. Kelly signed the encroachment agreement, would the fence stay in the same place or would the fence move over? The fence would stay in the same place. Okay. So given that, I have to assume that on the east of the fence there's sufficient land for the town of Ajax or operations to access the road allowance that we have to do any work, any clear out. To get the piece of equipment through there, there is space, yes. Okay. So we're never actually going to use the one and a half meters to the west of that fence line. Not to again, it's it's something that would be part of an encroachment agreement. Right. He would have to have that access too. So if you entered into an agreement, then we obviously would be reading property or ready to put through the <coughs> I guess my, my question is to, if you're a resident and you're looking at the property and you see a fence and you see the path and you see it maintained on this side, which is next to his house, but open on this side, you, you kind of assume that side's the town, that side is, with or without encroachment agreement, if you're just looking at it, it looks like it's his property. I guess what I'm getting at is, rather than go through the whole encroachment agreement, and have to renew it because it <coughs> says right in there and I think this is what he told me he has the issue mostly with it says it can be cancelled by the town at any time it's such a small area and having to have this encroachment agreement and having to maintain this encroachment agreement and and abide by it I just feel it'd be so much easier to sell them the little sliver of property and be done like it just it's finished it goes away so what, what are your thoughts on that? I mean, does that change anything? My thoughts are we've got direction from council and, and we're proceeding on that basis. Okay, thank you. Mayor Parrish. I would simply like to move, Madam Chair, that we reaffirm the, the previous position of, of council and direct staff to proceed expeditiously to enforce that. And in support of that motion, uh, I, you know, like, we have a, a responsibility to take care of the public interest. The public interest is to keep that entire uh, allowance for drainage purposes. And we don't know what in the future, what uh, will arise that will require us to uh, actively use and, and exploit that public resource. It is an outlet uh, to the lake upon on, on Tora Boulevard, which we have none except for the uh, the road allowance that runs down the lake at the extreme east end of, of on Toro Boulevard. Um, Mr. Kelly has known for years what the rules of the game are, and he keeps trying to push this and push this. And to me, that's totally unacceptable. As far as I'm concerned, he hasn't uh, executed this encroachment agreement and put himself in good standing with what our position is within a very short period of time days, weeks at the most, then we should just go ahead and enforce the thing because that seems to be the only thing that Mr. Kelly really kind of understands. So that's my position on it. And, uh, Thank you. Uh, Regent Councillor I agree with the Mayor 100%. I think we were more than generous 
with this issue. And um, I think we should move ahead and enforce it. With climate change and so on, it may be needed, that property, um, in years to come if there's uh, severe, severe weather and flooding. And it sets a really awful precedent that someone can just take over town property and then keep fighting to keep it to extend their their own property and um, uh, I just have no patience with this. I back onto a park. My backyard would look really nice if I could just take over some of the town's property. And there's all kinds of people in this town who have residents that um, they're adjacent to town property. And I think um, we should move ahead as the council resolution stated. And uh, I, I think it's taken too long. And um, we need to enforce the decision. Anything further? Was well, is, is that a motion or is what? Yeah, okay. Okay, because I was going to bring a different motion. Maybe we have to deal with that motion. Just, just to that. The only reason I'm bringing it forward is because this has been dropped along the way. There was somebody else dealing with this. With this, they're no longer with the town. This has gone on way too long. I absolutely agree. Um, I don't know if anybody has been down there in the last few weeks, but somebody's actually taken a, a, a bobcat or something and created themselves a, a launch ramp for their sea down there on that piece of town owned property. So, so this is. That's you a know, different something. I, I know it's a different <laughs> something and it's a different person, but I'm just saying this is the kind of things that are happening down there. Uh, but, but since it's been such a long time, the situation <coughs> has changed. I was going to ask staff just to go back and have a re look at it, but I guess we have to do with the motion on the floor right now. Okay, Steve's motion is to, for the staff to proceed with the <laughs> And uh, we quoted what's been asked for they, <coughs> to enforce the previous motion of, of council in 2013. Yeah, and on that, I've been back and forth on this, this issue all this time. And it literally is, he has been delaying on purpose, in my opinion. And uh, if we need, I was told at the time, and it sounded reasonable, and it still sounds reasonable. We may need that uh, that uh, in entry into the lake shore, and, and, and we may flooding issues. It could uh, affect it. So anyway, that's and he's been told on a number of occasions. And this is you going at it again, but anyway, we call vote. I wasn't brought into it before. It's okay. <laughs> On the resolution before committee, Regional Councillor Jordan. In favor. Regional Councillor Collier. No. That's okay. Councillor Crawford. No. Mayor Parrish. Yes. Chair Brown. Yes. Yeah, and on this item, um, I basically understand the provisions and I'm supportive of it. But my question to um, uh, primarily to Mr. Romanowski and, and Mr. Hannon as well is that 
We have a number of situations where we have significant rear lotting fences that have arisen from subdivisions over the years. I think it's been a pretty strong policy of our planning documents to avoid rear lotting as much as we can in favor of window streets and other treatments, um, which is fine. And I hope we're continuing to have that as a, as a policy. But when circumstances arise, and they do from time to time, you're left with no, no um, alternative but rear lot fencing. And they last for 10 years or 20 years or whatever they last. And then they start falling down, especially if they're board on board um, fences. But even more substantial ones have a certain shelf life. If they're replaced by the individual owners, and they're usually set up so that they're on private property or on the lot line, what you get on very prominent locations, on Ontario roads in particular, is a mishmash of replacements depending on the person's aesthetics, financial capabilities, conscientiousness, or whatever. And it has the potential to be extremely unsightly and extremely, you know, especially in, and they're usually in prominent locations. Like a classic example that goes back many, many years is, is that stretch of Harwood Avenue that, that, backs, that, that backs on to uh, near the lakefront on the on the uh, here. Yeah. yeah on the east side of the road um, but there are even much more prominent locations that that are right for this uh, westy road where it backs uh, onto the industrial area to the north and I can recite many of them so <coughs> is this bylaw or is in conjunction with this bylaw an appropriate place for staff to consider some kind of policy or policies to mitigate or eliminate or deal with this um, issue um, as they arise. In other words, if a, if a developer is required or wants to or is allowed to put up this type of rear lot fencing, um, should we be requiring some kind of um, deposit for um, uh, rehabilitation when it reaches its lifespan? Should we be um, considering policies that require the citizens that own these to uh, rebuild to certain standards? Um, should we be the third party referee that oversees and standardizes how these are done? I don't know what the answer is. But I think at least as a starting point, we should at least have an inventory of what our potential li what the potential liability is and what going forward, thinking about the taxpayer and everybody mm -hmm. else is, is, is the best way to approach it. Maybe I'm the only one who sees this as an issue, but I see more and more of these situations and sooner or later people are gonna go, what the hell's going on? That's extremely unsightly. What kind of image are we projecting to our citizens and to visitors. So I don't know if you have any comments on that. Well, just to touch on the inventory component. So planning has done, uh, this was about a year and a half ago, we've done a complete inventory of all rear reverse lot frontage or fencing adjacent to all arterial roads or major thoroughfares through the town, whether it be collectors or arterial roads. So we have that. We've also assessed the condition of all those fences and we also have assigned ownership of those fences based on our information so whether it's owned by the region or if it's along a regional right away or the town if it's along the town road or if it's a private fence in most cases though if it's in the older situations they may not have required like noise fencing uh, so that's the situation down at the bottom of Harwood but in most recent cases if it is fencing adjacent to an RTL road, that'll be covered off within the subdivision agreement or the site plan agreement as noise fencing, so that wouldn't be able to be removed from the property, and if it is to be replaced, it'll have to be replaced as, 
as it was originally approved through through those drawings. So a classic example of a, a well, maybe it is, correct me if I'm wrong, but a noise fencing on Salem Road, south of Highway 2, and north of the 401, north of uh, Dork Chapman, etc. Yep. Is that on private property, is that the requirement of individual owners to rectify that? In that case, that would be because it's a regional right of way, or Salem's now the town road, right? No, it's regional road. Regional now. road. So then that would have to be evaluated by the region and replaced by the region because that's a required noise wall that has to be in place as part of the, the development of those lands. Um, likewise, like Westian Highway 2 or where they're redoing those works. Um, How or, much of it is in private ownership where my concern as to a hodgepodge is likely to happen? Do you have well, we'd have to do the, we have all the, all the intel, we just would have to run the numbers to get the percentages as to what's town, what's region, what's privately owned. But we do have that inventory and we are going through a process right now where we're speaking to other municipalities within the GTA to see how they go about when the fence needs to be repaired. We ran into some issues with the fencing along the west side of Westney as you approach the interchange. And there's kind of a mishmash of who owns the, and some is owned by MTO, some's owned by the region, some's right. owned by the private landowner. Right. So we have all that information. Right now we're, what we're going through is taking an inventory or taking doing some research to find out how municipalities are dealing with that if is it all covered by the town is it the town in the region is it a three-way thing with the town the region and the private property owner so so staff is in the process of fact gathering and best practices with a view to bringing a report on this matter that's what we are intending on doing at some probably sometime in 2019 I just, I just wanted to make sure it was captured in some way. Yep. I didn't expect all the answers today, but I, I think it's an issue and it's going to emerge more and more. And I think that for us to have a, some basic policy on it, I think is, a, is important. Yeah, we've so also gone to the point where we've mm -hmm. measured the length and we understand the cost of different types of fencing. So if it's to the town standard, this is, this is what the costing would be based on linear meter. Uh, the style also we've contemplated well, you talked about the hodgepodge. You know, we don't want that. We want uniformity. Right. So what detail do we approve? Are there different types of detail depending on the, the part of town? You can even go around and see like the Wyndham Manor subdivision is a lot different than uh, Nottingham subdivision right. for reverse lot frontage fencing and noise fencing. So looking at how we deal with that and is there a couple options that we provide going forward depending on who's going to be doing that work so we want and there's different costs right if sure. it's the private landowner it's going to be more expensive for them to do that so is it a cheaper or is it a uh, simpler design for them to achieve as opposed to the region replacing the noise wall or the town dealing with the fence that's maybe along on the town road or on the town ownership so okay. Thank Those you. are the elements that we're also looking into. Okay, thank you. That's a color. Thank you, Madam Chair, through you to uh, Mr. Hannon. I, I read the part about the corner lot, but it doesn't address uh, my question, which is an, an issue right now on Westney Road where the house, the entire side of the house faces Westney Road. And with the widening, um, the, the new Westney Road has come right up almost to the fence line. You've got the fence, you've got a narrow sidewalk, and then it's Westney Road. And I've been dealing with the region as far as the noise fencing along there, because they're willing to do a noise fence in wood or concrete, but only for the rear yard. And I don't think the regional policy has ever um, thought about this, where the so where the you know the house faces this way, not this way. And so this this uh, resident is now in a situation where they said, okay, you can build a privacy fence, but you pay for it, which is fine. But he's on the understanding it can only be built, I think, one meter. Can you speak to that? Like, if, it, if it's the front yard, but it's on a main arterial road, is there any leap that they can build a six foot of proper privacy fence? Through the chair. So that issue that you've spoken of has already been dealt with through the region. Right now, currently, the fence as it sits now is six foot six in the rear yard. Right. 
They are entitled to use the side yard as well, so the region has agreed that they will extend, the, and it's not deemed to be a noise wall, it's a privacy fence, so the region is extending that fence beyond the outskirts of the garage, which will cover the entire house at, at a two meter fence. Well, that's good to know because I've been on this all the way through and they've been saying, no, we're not doing it. The reason they're saying, no, we're not doing it all the way through, our policy is very yard only. Ms. Bridgman's been dealing with the region okay. on it and we've had discussions. There's been diagrams sent to the region and they've acknowledged that for whatever reason in that section of, of West New Road, the house, the fence has stopped in the rear yard. It should have continued for the entire distance of the house, awesome. which would have been the end of the garage and they've agreed that they would do that as long as the town agrees that our bylaw permits that, which it does. Awesome. Thank you. Councilor Crawford. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm curious, are, are we actually able to enforce residents to standardize their fencing if they're rear facing like that? Through the chair, at, at, we would mandate right now, unless it was covered under a site plan or if it was covered under some kind of agreement, we would maintain that the standards of whatever it was built with, but right now we would not. If we mandated a six foot six rear yard fence to go into a property, if it was in a state of disrepair and we ordered it, as long as they put the fence back to a state of good condition, we wouldn't be able to say about scallops or we wouldn't be able, if they wanted to switch design. the chain link, that would be their right to do that as well. And is it is it is it your intent to do that in the future? Our, the plan is to try and unify a lot of areas to make sure that the mismatch fencing doesn't occur. As an example, in our own parking lot along Heatherwood, one giant fence was put into there when this construction of this parking lot happened and it's all uniform. Prior to that, every resident backing onto the town parking lot had different fencing at the time. It's just that it, the fencing is such an expensive thing for residents that, um, like I could understand if you're moving into an area, and I understand your concerns about uniformity and like looking nice and whatever, but it's still on like their property. And I can understand in a new area, subdivision or whatever, like that be included in full disclosure from real estate agents or whatever that eventually this would have to be changed and knowing that going into it um, that's I just I'm just concerned for residents and the cost that that would be through the chair again that's dealing with standard fencing if there was a noise wall in today's standards when they go in it would be on their deeds to state that they're okay. responsible for that as well and it would show up on their surveys where that fence is located um, but in relation we have to remember that our cost sharing bylaw exempts the town from entering into any form of cost sharing on any road that abuts a town owned road. Every time you see a corner intersection, the town would then, if we didn't exempt ourselves, we'd be required to pay for one or two sides of every fence. Um, and we yeah, obviously no, don't I, budget for those. No, I, I, and sorry for interrupting. I don't mean that we would cost share. I'm just saying that if this is the new norm, that it's gonna be at the pockets of the residents, right? and we would mandate the positioning of those fences has a great deal of what we can enforce if it's if it's through site plan or a development agreement then then it was installed in their property but that could be dealt with but if it wasn't positioning the fence just off the property line like we did on on Wesney Road that stone wall that, that runs behind Kirkham is the town's responsibility okay, okay. thank you any other questions Sorry, just follow up and thank you, Derek. I just I just brought up the email because it was it was just May 9th, so it's not old. And it says that, that speaking with Ms. Siopis wasn't committed, wasn't going to commit, provided with a link, so they're registered to appear before the delegation June 6th of our committee of the whole of the region. So can we confirm we're talking about the same? It, it's the, the two houses at Hedersley, north of Hedersley. Yeah, road. between Hedersley and Adley, those two. Darcy Ring and the other one. I don't know about two. I know of one in particular that the region was concerned that they would replace the existing fence, but they didn't want to go farther than that. Yes. And the town has confirmed that our bylaw would allow the six foot six fence to continue beyond that to the edge of the garage. Okay, but the region has agreed to. From what I understood put it in. From, from the email exchange, that the region has agreed to extend that fence based on the town's approval that it would meet the requirements of our fence bylaw. Okay. See where this goes. Thank you. Anything further? So, can I have a motion to approve the recommendation? All in favor? Opposed? It's carried. Thank, Thank you. you. So, we're into the presentation.
uh, 6.1 on the agenda, which is on page 88, the building permit fees review report. of the presentation today, um, I'm Andrew Grunda from Watson and Associates. Um, our firm has uh, been retained uh, by the municipality to update the, uh, the building permit fees and look at that from a long-term uh, financial sustainability perspective. Uh, we've got a long history of undertaking this work um, for the town. Uh, having looked at this over a number of years back when the building code was the first amendment in 2015 with respect to fees to make sure that it is sustainable uh, for the longer term operations. Um, and so the, the presentation that we prepared has been uh, summarized in a background study that, that's been released. We have undertaken public open house back in April with the development community to advise them of the, uh, the recommendations of that report. And uh, the intent is to, uh, to advise the community on those findings before bringing them forward to council. Um, so in the context of looking at the, the longer term sustainability, obviously what we have to have regard for the provisions under the Building Code Act and when that was amended, um, it capped fees for building permit purposes at the uh, anticipated cost of administration enforcement under the code. Um, and it also required that as part of those uh, legislative changes that municipalities need to report on the status of those fees uh, each year, uh, documenting the, the cost of service, both direct and indirect, and any reserve funds that have been accumulated for that purpose. And so it's important to note that uh, with respect to those reserve funds, uh, in 2005, that was a change to the Act, which segregated revenue and exclusively allowed it only to be used for building purposes, which had implications on other fees, uh, principally planning and application fees in that regard. And so in light of that, uh, that statutory requirement not to exceed those costs and to do so have a rationale with respect to the reserve fund, we employ an activity-based costing methodology, which uh, is illustrated on this next slide, um, we work with staff to understand what are these activities that are provided through building permits in the form of residential or non-residential permits, uh, as an example, whether those are new permits or alteration permits or other types of minor permits that are provided. Um, in looking at those various costing categories, we then estimate the, the amount of time staff that is, uh, uh, is spent administering those processes throughout the organization to make sure that those are reasonable uh, and, and could uh, withstand any challenge. That largely, that relationship of staff time to those activities largely form the majority of costs, which are direct salary, wage, and benefit costs. But then we also include indirect support costs of the organization, recognizing that those services could not be provided if they didn't have uh, human resource support, IT support, governance support, as an example. And so using that step cost approach allows us to assess those costs to those departments um, to, to add to those direct costs of administration. So the, the process that we've undertaken in this most recent update was to, to work with staff. Uh, we're looking at those building uh, costing categories uh, and updating those uh, to reflect most recent activity in terms of annualized volume over the last five years. Um, then in looking at the underlying processing times, and this probably does a good job of tracking that time data in Amanda. Um, we've used that as the basis uh, for the time to, to undertake that process generally and also to reflect what we commonly see in the industry by other ancillary time uh, related to things like enforcement uh, and administration of the code more generally in uh, establishing what those one-time uh, cost estimates should be. Um, having done that, that allows us to do our due diligence to ensure that the underlying estimates are reasonable. But what we also want to do is, is not to necessarily look at the effectiveness of those fees historically, but what they look like going forward. Uh, and so to do so, we've done a forecast for the five-year period of 2018 to 2022 and projected what those costs would be on an annualized basis over that period based on uh, those volumes of activity. And that allows us when we apply the municipality's current fee structure to those volumes to assess how well you're doing, not only recovering your total cost of service, but within those respective costing categories. 
And so that's important because what we want to ensure is not just that the municipality can pay for the cost of service on an annualized basis, but also to make sure that there's a sustainable amount of revenue being generated such that if there was a downturn in activity, you'd be able to still have qualified staff available to be able to process uh, the volumes in accordance with the requirements of the Act when the economy more generally was to recover. And so we do that by looking at establishing what a reasonable building permit policy should be. So in applying that methodology um, and the findings for the forecast period from 2018 to 2022, what we've noticed is that the municipality's volumes in terms of total permits are expected to decline over that period, and that's largely reflective uh, of a shift from low-density residential building permits to high-density residential building permits over the forecast period. And what we also see is increased trends of alteration permits, both residentially uh, and, and more constantly from non-residential over that period of time, and also some lag effects with respect to population by having increased volumes uh, anticipated in non-residential categories, uh, such as ICI. Um, and so the reason why we, we, we do this, and in particular why it's important, is that what we commonly <coughs> see in costing results is that uh, minor permits and alteration permits generally are not set to recover their cost of service. And so because municipalities are, are in essence, losing money on those types of permits, we must make sure that we're designing our fee structure on, on new permits to provide cross-subsidy to make sure that that is sustainable and can be funded from building permit revenues and not relying on tax-based sources. And so when we're looking to, to measure that, as I mentioned a couple times, this reserve fund is important. We need to make sure that we're not just recovering our costs, but that uh, if we have a downturn, uh, recognizing that the Act has mandated turnaround times for processing permits and undertaking inspections, that if the municipality was to recover, that uh, we have a reasonable amount of, of staff available to, to meet those mandated times. And so the way that's been done is historically by looking at those downturns this, uh, and then looking at that reduction in volume uh, as, a, as a representation of the annual processing capacity of the municipality. And so that target was set at about 2.4 times annual direct costs uh, in prior studies uh, dating back to 2007. The municipality is currently operating at a, at a surplus revenue in that reserve account of about uh, 0.74 times. So suggesting that there's still room to add to that reserve fund uh, before uh, any potential reduction fees may be required in that you would be inside of the statutory requirement of only recovering your costs. And so over that forecast, that five-year forecast period, on average what we're expecting in 2018 dollars is that the municipality's costs um, for direct uh, services related to the permanent volumes would be about 1.4 million a year. Indirect costs um, account for about 22% of those annual processing costs or about 0.39 uh, uh, million dollars a year. And then recognizing again that the municipality while currently recovering its costs um, it has a relatively modest reserve fund, we want to build in additional provisions to contribute to that to provide sustainable uh, levels of operational funding going forward. And so that's estimated at budgeting a target of about $400,000 a year. And so at full cost recovery levels of direct, indirect, and stabilization, the municipality should be targeting about 2.2 million in revenue annually over the next five years. When we compare that to your current building permit fees, again, you're doing a fairly good job in terms of recovering those costs uh, recovering about 93% uh, of those costs annually from your current fees today. However, if we were to keep those fees unchanged, we would see that uh, that multiple in terms of your reserve fund being relatively constant over the five-year period, not providing uh, any future sustainability uh, beyond those levels. So in light of that, what is being recommended is to, to increase fees um, to make sure that they're in line with market levels to provide you with that additional sustainability. And the way that's being recommended to be undertaken is that uh, recognizing the under recovery uh, in terms of costs for alteration permits, uh, accessory permits and the like, and what we're seeing is that moving the municipality to market levels would help you improve those, those losses, um, provide you with additional revenue for sustainability and not uh, rely directly on cross subsidization uh, from new permits in that regard. Um, even with that, it's only improving your overall cost recovery performance by about 
in that regard. And that's important because we don't want people to navigate around the regulatory process by charging them uh, much higher levels than what the market would bear. Um, what that also requires is that when we look at new permit fees for residential, that there's room to move within the current market of the area of municipalities within the region uh, to also to provide additional support. And so in the context of those recommendations, you can see for new residential permits, uh, the current fees today are about $11 a square meter, lower than those rates that are being imposed uh, for other <coughs> serving municipalities in the region and outside the region of New York, in, in Durham and Richmond Hill. So we're recommending increasing those from about $11 a square meter to $13.50 a square meter, comparable to those market averages. And also when we look at alterations uh, for those various types of permits, increasing them up uh, more aggressively to market levels to improve that overall cost recovery performance. And based on those fee recommendations uh, for Council's consideration, what we're anticipating is that revenues would increase by about 15% over current levels, uh, adding an additional 314,000 uh, in revenue annually. That would serve to uh, continue to buffet that reserve fund, increasing it from a point uh, 74 times annual cost to about 1.76 times by the end of the forecast period, still well within your target level of about 2.4 times. It does so by improving your cost recovery performance on those alteration and minor permits, where today you're recovering about 37% of those costs, moving them to market levels would see you recovering about 42%, and your ability to provide that sustainability by still being competitive within the market. And so these subsequent slides sort of illustrate uh, the impact of those, those recommendations. And so if we look at a multi-residential apartment development of about 200 residential units, that would move through a, a plan of condominium, site plan, zoning bylaw amendment uh, as part of the planning application, pay its respective building permit fees and its development charges. Uh, what you'll note is that that increase in the, the building permit fee, which is about 22% on its face, uh, only represents about a 0.8 of 1% increase in the overall cost of development. And the reason why that is, is because your relative market position is largely dictated by your development charges policies in that respect, and less so by your building permits. So to put it another way, the roughly $200 per unit increase in building permit fees um, is going to serve to, to continue to fund that operation without having marketable impacts in terms of the affordability to the, the end customer. And similarly, if we look at industrial, uh, currently we're not uh, recommending any increase in the industrial building permits, so those would stay relatively constant. Um, in terms of your overall market position, the building permits representing about 4% uh, of the overall cost of development uh, when you factor in development charges in that regard. Uh, and so that concludes uh, our presentation. In terms of next steps, um, is to receive any input or questions from the committee. Uh, there will then be a staff report with any changes to the report coming forward uh, to the committee again on June the 11th. And then uh, the bylaw will be considered by council for approval on June 18th with the proposed rates effective uh, uh, January, sorry, July 1st of this year. And that concludes the presentation. Thank you for your presentation. Any questions? Mr. Jordan? Yes, um, thank you. I wondered, I, I think it said in the report that they're indexed every year. How do, is that how we make sure we don't fall behind? Yes, so again, it's, it's a matter of uh, addressing those fees and having them indexed so they keep pace with your underlying costs because I mentioned the majority of that is salary wage benefits. So what's that figure based on? That's what I want to know because I don't want to fall behind. Yeah, and so is we've modeled right? it now based on your historic uh, inflation rates respect to what you've seen in budget periods. So our own budgets inflation rates. That's correct. Because and again, the reason why it's important is so the municipality, like other municipalities, looks at this periodically. Mm -hmm. Right. So roughly about every five years looking at this to make sure that it's keeping pace with where you're going mm -hmm. and, and having it paid for exclusively by these revenues. Um, and so if the municipality was going to, to make those adjustments annually based on actual budget impacts, that would require build, uh, annual um, public meetings to occur. And so by forecasting that at an index rate, 
That allows you to be transparent to the market, allow them to know how those will be increased annually, and then allow you to react if there's anything that requires that to occur because of the significant change. But other than that, maintaining it and reviewing it periodically for five years. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I absolutely agree growth has to pay for growth, and, and these reflect our actual costs. But I would, I would assume that the costs are similar with other like-sized municipalities. So two that I noticed on here, uh, Whitby and Milton, I noticed that on a couple we're lower, we're we're the same, but on a lot of the comparators, they're lower. And I wonder why. And, and to me, it's probably because I know their growth is a lot higher than ours right now. And is it a volume thing? There, there is economies of scale. Okay. Um, and, and typically where we see that more so is how that plays out in greenfield municipalities and infield municipalities. So as I mentioned in, in the comments earlier, what you can see commonly across the province is municipalities generally losing money on alteration permits. Uh, so in this case, you're recovering about 35, 40% of your costs. Right. And in infill municipalities, what happens is that tends to create a greater proportion of your annual building permit volume as you need to build it. Right. And so because of that, what that's requiring now is for you to cross subsidize those losses against other types of the new permits, like okay. new residential, new multi-res, ICI, for example. So ours are higher because we have more infill. Right, so now you've got, a, because you have that volume creating that, it's causing you to, to increase some fees in other cases where, if I'm a greenfield municipality with a lot of greenfield volumes where I'm generating profits, yeah. I have a greater economy of scale in terms of pricing. Okay, and to the commercial numbers that you had, I think your second or third last slide, you showed Ajax, and we're lower than a lot of the bigger ones, Toronto those, but, but then you showed Oshawa, and Pickering were, were quite a bit lower than us. And I wonder where do we stand as far as the, the five Lake Shore municipalities? And, and so again, with that, that slide, that's with respect to Industria. So again, what this is telling, or what this is showing more so, is not necessarily your position with respect to building permits, but how your DC policy for industrial yeah. compares yeah. to those other municipalities. So for example, uh, in Oshawa, where the, the city exempts industrial, uh, that's why they have a, a lower uh, DC in that respect. Okay. And so this is again more, I think, a product of your DC policy and, and how that is, is comparable to those other municipalities <coughs> uh, than your building and planning fees. Because if you look at the small bottom of that stacked bar, that is the building and planning fees uh, and how those compare. And so if we were removing DCs, uh, we'd probably see that a little bit more comparable in the city of Oshawa, as an example. But Pickering doesn't wave. Pickering doesn't wave like Oshawa. No, it doesn't, but it has, uh, this time when we just recently completed the DC study, there was uh, reductions in terms of industrial, uh, non res DCs. Okay. All right, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Anything further? I have a motion to receive your information on paper. Any opposed? Carried. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, bridge modification for Metro Lakes, uh, point two on the agenda, page 109. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you everyone. Uh, today we have a, a brief presentation uh, that follows very closely to the staff report that you have. It uh, gives you uh, an outline. So what I want to talk to you about today, a little bit about the project background, uh, specifically the Harwood Avenue Bridge, which is the bridge that is affected to the town of Ajax, uh, the bridge modification agreement that we're looking at at the moment, and then next steps for the project as a whole. So some, some background, uh, Metrolinx, as you know, is endeavoring to electrify or convert six of their eight go rail corridors from diesel to electric power uh, between 2019 and 2025. Uh, their purpose is they want to provide faster, more reliable, more convenient ways 
for people to use their transit system. So the six of the eight uh, is the Lakeshore East corridor, the Lakeshore West, uh, the Kitchener station or Kitchener line uh, to uh, Grandma Lee, so just by that green uh, marker, the Berry Go line its full extent and the Stouffville goal line for its full extent. The two that won't be electrified are the Richmond Hill goal line and the Milton goal line. <coughs> so electrification for them is a, a quite an onerous or extensive process and entails significant planning and design, significant planning, design and implementation of a traction power supply system as well as the distribution uh, to their overhead contact system that they will be installing along the corridors. Uh, so the, the diagram that they provided us, you can see, uh, they'll have some, some switching and, and components that will have to interface with Hydro One and then bring the power to the corridor to the overhead contact system, which is supported by uh, portals along the corridor. So the Harwood Avenue Bridge, uh, as a result of this electrification, uh, will require the installation of a protective barrier. <coughs> the purpose of the barrier is meant to protect the public from the energized equipment. Uh, the characteristics, as we know the, the characteristics as we know them now, is that it's a solid-faced barrier. Uh, will be about two meters in height above standing, above the standing surface, and will extend. Uh, they gave us two dimensions, so three meters beyond the overhead contact system and five meters beyond the center line of the track. So in our case, there are two tracks that will be electrified. Uh, the two northern tracks, so if you picture at Harwood, there are four rail tracks that go under the bridge. It's the two that are closer to the highway are the two that are metrolink and will be electrified. So as a result, with those dimensions, we're estimating a barrier of between probably 13 and 15 meters in length to cover both of those tracks and uh, realize those required dimensions. So at this point, Metrolinx has asked uh, area municipalities to complete what they're calling a bridge modification agreement letter. And the purpose of this letter is to specify our preference on specific elements of that barrier uh, in discussion, uh, or in discussions of preparing this letter, we've uh, had communications with Durham Region and have purposely coordinated our choices in an, an attempt to ensure that all bridges, or all protective barriers on bridges uh, appear uh, similar. And so the coordinated preference types with Durham Region, so the color, the color preference, uh, preference of the metal elements of the barrier are going to be a uh, light gray and then the panel type is an opaque panel type. Uh, we asked Metrolinx to provide us with a conceptual image so you see in front of you is a conceptual image of what that barrier would look like. Uh, as, I, as I noted it's on the two northern uh, or uh, in front of the two northern rail pieces. This conceptual image actually shows the opaque uh, panel types. Those two middle ones that look uh, <coughs> bluish in, in color are actually meant to be opaque. Uh, and then uh, the transparent, or sorry, they are the two are, are the transparent, the remainder of white are the opaque. So next step for us, uh, we need to uh, they've asked that we submit the bridge modification letter to them. Uh, they will then work, uh, complete the necessary work uh, to complete the term sheets, which will outline all permissible bridge modifications. Uh, they've told us that uh, at a later date they plan on coming back to all affected municipalities to give a larger presentation on the project. Uh, and they, they've told us and indicated that their target date for completing the necessary legal agreements is at the end of this year. They've also noted to us that they are going to be subject to a blackout window in the months of August, August from August to October this year, so that we should expect uh, 
no communication from them during that period of time. Mm -hmm. Mr. Jordan, yes. Uh, that entire bridge looks so utilitarian. There's nothing attractive about it. Is there anything we can do? It's our main street. It, um, I know at one time we asked if we could put plants or something, but God forbid that we make it look nice. And, and now. Now I'm wondering if there's something we can do with this. Uh, through the chair, at, at this moment, they've asked for simply the, uh, the specifications, the, as I said, the color and the uh, panel material. Uh, we will have an opportunity to review the legal agreements once they're completed. Um, but in, in, in expressing the purpose of this barrier, Metrolinx does see it as utilitarian. As I said, they're trying to protect their electrified equipment. And I get that, but I want it to look nice too. Yeah. And, and I think currently the bridge doesn't look attractive. So if there's anything we can do to make it look a little more attractive <coughs> and inviting, I think we should be trying to do it. Maybe it's the way that appears um, from our side that we can do something with the, the embossing, put the HMS Ajax <coughs> on it. I don't know, but do something that makes it look interesting and attractive. Other towns and places, they make their bridges look nice, and ours doesn't. So that's my point. And to wait until it comes back, the legal paperwork, so to ensure that's something absolutely we can look at, I would also um, note that Metrolinx will, will maintain ownership of those structures or of the protective barrier. So it's something that they will control both from a maintenance and a replacement perspective. So if there's, uh, in the future, if a panel, for instance, is damaged or vandalized, they and their contractor will be responsible for those elements. So I'd imagine if if, uh, if if it is our request to put planters of some sort, we would have to determine how those would be maintained as well. Well, I don't know if it's that, but I just think um, it's our bridge, right? It's MTOs. It's, it's 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 we only have a surface, um, a surface agreement or a surface maintenance agreement. We maintain the paved surface, but the structure is empty. Well, if you can do anything to make it look more attractive, I think we should at least attempt. Yeah. Anything further? I'll move it. All in favor? Any opposed? Jared just received an email from Derek Hannon. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. 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 Y